afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for being here and trying to share this part of the afternoon with us, uh, speaking a little bit about recovery processes and well-being. Uh, we are with a very special panel because uh, we are at the World Football Summit, and, and, and we need to say thank you to World, to World Football Summit for, for permitting us to be here. And sure, the, the profiles of the group of experts that we have here are not very football. But in any case, uh, what we were speaking yeah. is, in this case, football, when we speak about mental skills and mental ability, need to introduce still uh, many strategies or many ideas that can be shared. So in this case, instead of me uh, introducing each one, as every profile here is very special and very characteristic, uh, all the panelists, their sales started from Kristen, they are going to be introducing themselves and explaining when they are coming from and what they are doing. So Kristen, Excellent. Please. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Kristen Holmes. I'm the Vice President of Performance Science at a physiological monitoring device company called Whoop. We specialize in monitoring training load um, and just general load throughout the day, um, as well as recovery, so kind of your capacity to take on load, and sleep. And uh, my area of, of kind of um, involvement in the company is really working on research collaborations um, with external partners, uh, looking at different aspects of sleep and recovery and strain. Um, my personal area where I spend a lot of my time is around female physiology and recovery, um, as well as um, looking at all the temporal cues that impact our circadian system and how that relates to mental and physical health resilience. Um, so that's just a quick summary, as a former athlete, um, played uh, two sports in college at the Big Ten, in the Big Ten at the University of Iowa, and I was an Olympic level athlete um, for seven years playing field hockey, and a coach for a long time. <laughs> so. Thank you very much, Christian. So, mm -hmm. Dr. Sang. Uh, so, I'm, uh, my name is Dr. Meeta Singh. I'm a psychiatrist and a sleep medicine specialist. So, I did my training at Mayo Clinic, and um, I have an expertise and experience working with professional athletes. So, in the United States, I work with Major League uh, Baseball, NBA, the NHL, the NFL. I've done some work with, um, with uh, football here in Europe too, uh, which, and college athletes. And, um, you know, I, um, I, I think it's really important to, to talk about the subject mm. because sometimes talking about sleep is not even on, on the athlete or a team member's radar. And it's really, really important because it's everything you do before you actually get onto the stage of mm. playing that makes an important, um, makes an impact of how they're going to be playing um, mm -hmm. in that game. Mm. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Rassain. Uh, Matteo, please. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Matteo Bartalucci. I'm a doctor, an emergency physician, and I am the head of medical service of Formula Medicine, which is a company based in Italy. It's a sports medicine company who has been providing medical service for many Formula One teams during the last 30 years. And then we have a clinic in Italy where we are specialized in mental and athletic preparation, especially for professional drivers. But during the last years, we have been trying to expand our field of expertise inside our uh, other sports. So we are now training uh, from a mental point of view, uh, tennis players, skiers, some soccer players. Um, we created uh, a mental gym, which is basically a gym entirely dedicated to mental training because we want to raise the awareness of the importance to train the brain to optimize the mm -hmm. brain resources. So not to use the sports psychologist only when there is a problem, but to go and train in the gym also when you are fit and well. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, if it, the brain is not working well, even your body is not performing well. So we believe in the way of, say, uh, men sana in corpore sano and vice versa. So <laughs> that's it. Grazie, Matteo. Thomas? I'm Thomas Roos. I'm an athlete, a scientist, and an entrepreneur. Uh, as an athlete, I'm a professional triathlete uh, for the United States and still competing, like our other two professional athletes. I'm still hanging in there at 37, <laughs> um, thanks to some wellness and recovery techniques that we'll talk about. And as a scientist, my training is in biology, genomics, and in clinical research. And I like to merge the basic science with the translational side of things. And all the projects I work on and all the research I do is on how we can use technology and scientific advances to optimize elite level performance. And so, for example, I'm, I'm working 
on academic research at the University of Lausanne Hospital at the Stanford Medical Center, and in the football context, um, doing research with the Football Genomics Consortium, which is a group of geneticists and physiologists um, working on elite level football and how we can bring advances into the world of football. Thank you, Thomas. And next to me, Agustina. Hello, everyone. My name is Agustina Giovanni. I'm the Director of Mental Performance and Culture in DC United. I work with the first team, with the guys, um, and also work with all the institutions trying to to develop a mental performance culture, not only focusing on the training, uh, like my friend said in the, in the actual gym and training on the field, but also we also call mental gym, <laughs> um, where we train the mind as a muscle, exactly like he said, and we try to help them understand and help them think and trying to get the message from the coaches, trying to see if uh, there is any gap between what they understood or what the coach is trying to say on the culture that the, the institution and the coaching staff, especially the head coach, wants for the whole team. So we try to move forward with that idea and also work with the All Blacks and national teams and football like soccer players or footballistas uh, in an individual uh, sphere, national teams, European teams too, and trying to make them think and trying to um, work out the edge. They want to feel, they want to do something else, something different to, to be better. So we work on that. And my personal side, um, I was a former Olympic swimmer. I swam for Argentina in two Olympics. And I used to work more with individual sports. So now I only do football or soccer. OK, thank you, Agustina. And the last one, me, I'm Alex Sanchez. And in my case, it's like football. I'm directing a, a football master in Real Madrid School. What we share, as you have seen, um, it's different profiles, different backgrounds, but we share the idea that through mental performance, through mental training, we are able to improve the, the performance of players uh, in competition. So we want to open that, uh, trying to answer, or at least trying to do some comments to our first question. We are going to go back to Kristen, but after that, up to you. Uh, I want to remember you. Don't, don't feel uh, ashamed of interrupt or comment uh, on the opinions of the other panelists. Okay. The first question of the first idea we want to comment is: What is at the foundations of mental and physical health resilience, Kristen? What do you think? Yeah. I, you know, I think folks probably have a lot of different opinions, but I think if we think about it at a foundational level, uh, there are very specific physiological and psychological variables or influences that move around our ability to exert resilience. And resilience, I think we kind of need to define it because we probably will say that word a fair amount. In my view, it's our capacity to adapt to external stress in a functional way. If I can adapt to stress in a functional way, for the most part, <laughs> I'm doing okay. Um, there's things that are gonna move around our ability to adapt to stress in a functional way. Number one, without a doubt, is sleep. <laughs> and we have a sleep scientist to be a researcher and, 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 and medical doctor to be able to uh, glom on there. But um, I do a lot, of, a lot of research as well in this area. Um, and I think at the very foundation, and we see this bubble up in the research that we're doing, um, we just finished a huge research study with, um, with the US Army, uh, which will, will go to publication. And then we see tons of data emerge in our very large data set at WHOOP, where we're measuring sleep, strain, and recovery. Um, and the single most important behavior that we see move around, and again, we're talking about the foundation of physical and mental health resilience, what we see moves around physical and mental health resilience the most is the degree to which individuals stabilize when they go to bed and when they wake up. It's called sleep regularity. Andrew Phillips coined this. Um, he's a, a sleep scientist out of Monash. Um, we call it sleep consistency. And we measure this, and we're 99.9% uh, .9 accurate being able to tell you when you're awake and when you're, um, when you're not. So this is a metric that is uh, very good, uh, very accurate. And again, we see this bubble up as being the biggest predictor of mental and physical health resilience. So physical resilience measured by the objective markers that we're tracking, so heart rate variability and resting heart rate, for example, and then um, and resting heart rate, oh, sorry, uh, respiratory rate and some of the other uh, metrics that we're tracking. Psychological resilience, uh, all the gold standard of you know, how we measure someone's psychological resilience are being taken into account. And again, so from my vantage point and what I've been able to see in the data, sleep consistency is probably at the, at the foundation of uh, mental and physical health resilience. 
Well, I was, what I was going to say, I was going to tag on to what mm. you're saying. So if you think about, um, you know, the basics of what is important for performance and wellness, it really comes down to nutrition, training, and sleep, mm -hmm. right? So if you think of those three as, um, as being foundational, and you, and, you, and you also put into uh, account, take into account the fact that we spend one third of our life sleeping, mm -hmm. right? Which means about, um, which means that, that the time that when you're not really on the, play, on the playing field, a majority of that is actually mm -hmm. while you're sleeping. And I just want to come back and just explain what, you, what um, uh, Christian was talking about. So, you know, when you think about sleep, you think about things like how much sleep you've got, which is the quantity of sleep. Um, typically, seven to nine hours is what is recommended. You talk about the good quality of sleep is which how, how well you're sleeping through the night, you know, are you, how, how much you're awake at night, etc. But then there's the regularity, which is you're trying to go to bed at the same time and trying to wake up at the same time, which becomes a big issue for any professional sports because the way that football or any other sport is, um, is structured, it has varying schedules. You know, the time that you compete is different. You also take into account travel, which is becoming more and more significant. Mm. And so regularity becomes the one aspect of sleep that is most difficult to accomplish when you're a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes really, really important to sort of, um, you know, to, to focus on that. And of course, uh, you know, the fact that you can now get data, uh, that's brilliant. And then, it, you know, then the second step is what you do with that data. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like to add something. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I'm obsessed with sleeping. Everyone yes. knows me. Um, from, I love it, and I know being a swimmer, you know, sleeping all the time, being obsessed because we don't have time to sleep, we don't have time to do anything but swimming. Um, I'm going to talk from a coach. As a coach, uh, it's hard for me sometimes because I think uh, I talk as a swimmer or an athlete, but talking as a coach, how I coach my soccer players or, or football players, um, of course, understanding them that sleeping is important, the quality of sleeping, what time they're going to sleep, that's the biggest mm -hmm. discussion we have uh, often. Mm -hmm. um, but my resilience, the minimum resilience with the work with the guys and the girls are, is um, what do they do when they have to struggle? That's how they see resilience or how, that's how we train resilience uh, based on results because as all we all know, uh, we live based on results. And especially in football, especially at least in the league that I work in, and if we don't win, then there is a big issue for the head coach, for the president or owner of the club, and for the captain, and for, for everyone. So even myself, I, I have pressure because we haven't won in how many uh, days and stuff like that. So when we work on resilience, uh, after taking, like, looking into all this data, is how do the player like, try to resignificate what they're doing, how they push through it. I have a lot of uh, players injured. So I need to, we need to coach them how, what is the meaning and where, where are they going to find their strength to overcome uh, the different challenges. So I, it's like we have different meanings of, of resilience and how you use the mm -hmm. data from. And it's, if it's from how we, for example, the sleeping part, I have to educate them first because mm -hmm. a lot of them don't know and I make them use Mm -hmm. your devices, you know, for, for, for tracking that, but also there's a lot of education and then it comes, that's where they play from, you know, yeah. and here. Yeah, because we are speaking about the sleep, but there are two contextual factors that you say, one is wrestle, the other is schedule, no? We were speaking yeah. before about right. Formula yeah. One, for example, Formula, schedule. For a Formula One driver, it's a nightmare. Mm. Uh, they are increasing the number of races all over the world, so basically they live on a plane, so thanks to, to the, the technology, mm. uh, of course, they, they know how to deal with a jet lag disorder, but I agree with that the management of sleep is one of the most important things when we're talking about performance and resilience. And, and another thing that, in my opinion, is important is the, 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 the self-awareness. This is why in our mental gym, whatever we try to do with our athletes, and we do a lot of mental tests while we monitor their brain activity and their heart rate, is to show them how their body is reacting in front of different mental, mental tests. So putting them in front of numbers in terms of brain activation, brain strain, uh, 
uh, heart rate is the only way to raise their awareness and mm -hmm. is the only way to make sure that they can control their body when they are under stress in mm -hmm. difficult situation. And I think this is the big value of what we have been doing so far inside the mental gym. A lot of drivers come back to us to say that they, now that they have been training with us, when they jump inside the car, they can really understand the moment when they start to overthink, when they start to get tense, because of course, there are a lot of connection in the mind and between the mind and the muscles. So the more you start to overthink, the more you get tense, the more you lose coordination and the, 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 the more you can fail your, uh, your goal. So there are a lot of, uh, of things inside the word resilience, but I think that the, one of the most important things, apart from sleep, is the raise of the self-awareness. Because the more you know yourself, the more you know how your body is reacting to different kind of stress, mm -hmm. it, the, the, the more you can control and manage yourself, even in difficult situation and when you are under pressure. This is why, for example, we do a lot of tests uh, inside the mental gym in competition just to try to put a, a pressure on the, on the athletes. Mm -hmm. And we have, for, for instance, a, a test where the only thing we require the athletes to do is to stay focused, okay? And we see the heart rate sometimes is over 130, and the only thing they have to do is to stay focused. So, especially drivers, when they are in competition, they get really tense, and it's really funny to see. Thomas, so. you are still competing. You were saying, you, I think you are totally agree with Dr. Assign with the foundations of what is a, a top performance athlete. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a good segue also um, now to talk about like a framework for optimal physical performance and physical resilience. and. You know, it basically comes down to, as elite athletes, we push our bodies to the breaking point. And the holy grail of using data and technology is to understand when you're one session, one training session away from being injured, hmm. and then back it off just enough and understand exactly how much recovery you need so you can start training again at the appropriate intensity and duration as soon as possible. Longevity in sporting careers is from finding this happy spot in the physical performance side. And I think that's something that we're getting much better at now versus 10 years ago, and we see this in the data, so something I didn't yet mention. Um, I'm also an athlete representative and work at the International Olympic Committee on the Science and Medical Department, and we've been tracking now at the Olympic Games performances, injuries, and illnesses now for about 20 years, and we see clear trends in, in increasing injuries um, amongst athletes in certain sports and decreased in other sports, and we're really mandated now to try to find this medium of where you can be physically in your prime on that day at the Olympics. That's the holy grail, because you got one shot to win that gold medal combining that now with all the stuff that we're talking about, about mental and how the mind helps the body achieve that ideal performance. And I think that's something as elite athletes, you, you takes you a couple years to figure your body out. And what one of my goals is, is to help coaches and other athletes understand that we have the tools now where you can shortcut this trial and error process and bring it down from Let's just take an example of five years to maybe three, two to three years where you can find this right balance to achieve the optimal physical performance. I would like to share sort of like, like experience. Uh, I was listening to all you, all you and thinking this is amazing. And we all agree and I wish I knew you before. And I always try to check Same. myself. No, but I know. I wish but, they were my coaches I know. before. Um, try to bring myself back into reality and says, so sorry, I'm going back to football all the time, to soccer all the time and trying to be practical because I think uh, the big gap, at least for the mental side, the mental training is, uh, we always know the why, the what, but not the how. And what uh, we are experiencing, my colleagues in America at least, is that this data is amazing. However, we face a football, football culture that is different. I come from the Olympic world and this is normal. And then I got into the, the football uh, world and, and it takes some time and it takes some people that are actually very uh, educated and prepared, but it takes time to, for the, even the coaching staff and, and trying to transmit it to the players and trying to make it real. And I wish there's 
that process will be accelerated so we can... I totally agree that you know, the football culture is so strong and it's, sometimes it's difficult for us in football introducing new ideas coming yes. from other areas or sport for sure. Yeah. This, we, we have um, uh, started to speak about injuries mm. uh, and mm. I want to ask you for the things that you are saying, how or what are the steps where this uh, mental training that uh, yeah. all of you are putting in practice, how can help or how, what are the steps for developing this training? Yeah. Mateo, if you want. Yeah, for example, the mental gym that we have is really close to the physical gym that we have. They, they have more or less the same uh, dimension because we really believe that there must be a combination of the two. Mm. So, for example, each athlete is training with us, is training 50% of, of the time in the physical gym, 50% of the time in the mental gym. But why all that? Because we did a lot of research in the past that uh, demonstrated how the brain of the top drivers inside a functional MRI scan was different compared to the normal people. They were medical students, so not very normal people. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, the same age, so we can do a comparison between the, the, the two groups. And the difference was not in terms of performance. Let's take a simple example, the reaction time, OK? If we compare the reaction time of professional drivers and mm, not drivers, they are exactly the same. It means that I can beat Charles Leclerc 50% of the time in reaction time. So the big difference is how, um, how much brain resources a not driver person need to put to obtain the same result. And which char this characteristic is being called by, uh, by our scientists mental economy or neural efficiency. So their, their ability to save energy while trying to reach high performance. And from there, we started to develop a, a methodology which we call mental economy training. Uh, which is true not only for mental performance, but also for the physical training, because due to the, all the connection that we have between muscle and, uh, and brain, we believe that if you are able to save energy to optimize the brain resources, uh, you can get less muscle or tension, and so you can get less injury compared to, to others. So for us, there is a, this is what we call psychophysical exercises. There is a, a perfect combination between mental training and uh, physical training that can, lead to, that can reduce the number of injuries as well. And that, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mira. Okay. Well, and that, that mental training that he is talking about, you know, that's one thing that can, that can separate you from another elite athlete who has perhaps the same, um, you know, physical and other abilities. So the, the uh, you know, what you do during practice, if you can do exactly that yes. during the real competition, that ability is what, you know, ma might differentiate you from another player of your, the same caliber. And of course, it takes mental training. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm biased and I, I, I can tell you that um, there are different prediction mod models meant for, say, injury prediction, and typically, you know, like most of the data shows that like sleep is really, really important because yes. what happens is that, um, you know, if you, if you get less sleep, your reaction time is, is impaired, your accuracy is reduced, but in, in addition to that, your judgment, your decision making, et cetera, is significantly impaired. And if your judgment is impaired while you're slower and less accurate, you're going to put yourself in a position in which the chances of injury is going to increase. But I also want to just circle back to what um, Augustina was talking about, because you know, that is the importance of education. Because typically, clubs, especially if they've been successful, or clubs that have been around for a long time have been doing things at a certain way. And you know, it's, it's same old, same old. And so to introduce new, new concepts to them, it takes a while. You have to really talk to them, and you have to sort of sell the science to them to make it more easier for them to, mm. so, to talk about. That's yeah, about trust and credibility and coming yes. in with an open mind and presenting mm -hmm. things in, in the elite world of sports and not, right. not thinking that you're the best ever and leaving your ego at the door and really collaborating right. with everyone right. within the club. And I think... Trying to, to speak their, their own language from yeah. athlete to athlete to player, <laughs> yeah. from player to yeah. player, something similar. And I mean, what, yeah, trying what, to make it easier, right? What, what we have seen work, um, at least in, in the work that I've been working on in, in professional football is with injury reductions and these models for injury reduction and 
adding in new components um, like genetic testing and blood biomarker testing, and eventually we're gonna get to where we're doing whole omics profiling on elite level athletes. Um, the cost right now is like a million dollars if you wanna do this for one person, but it's coming down exponentially. The cost of these technologies is dropping twice as fast as Moore's Law, and our computational power is growing exponentially with the new generation of GPUs and supercomputers and the AI and the ML models that we've built. And so while our injury prediction right now is not great, and I'm, I'm a scientist and I will tell you exactly, like honestly, what the situation is for technologies or risk prediction models or whatever, it's not very good right now for some injuries, but for others it is. And so we have to, we're going to get better at this by incorporating all these other covariates and influencers that we haven't yet captured in the data. And then it'll be just a question of validating it so we can think of it as, is it scientifically valid? If it is, then yes, you can go to the next step. Then is it clinically valid or clinically meaningful? And if it is, then yes, then you can start approaching the elite football clubs and asking in the sporting specific context for the use that the club wants to use it, does this have any sporting utility? So it could, it could be great, the science could be fantastic, but if it's not gonna move the needle on what a coach does or how an athlete trains, then there's no sport specific utility and it's not worth the price um, at this point. Christian, you wanted to say... Yeah, I mean, we have um, huge amounts of uh, sporting data across all, yeah. all professional sports, as well as uh, many EPL teams, and so lots of football as well. And I can tell you, if the athletes can get sleep right, you can simplify your life <laughs> a ton. I mean, if you can... I mean, we see in the data, we have a metric called sleep debt, and it's basically, we will recommend how much time you need to spend in bed, and the delta between how much time you spend in bed and what you actually spend in bed is a metric called sleep debt. We see that athletes who keep this under 45 minutes literally are bulletproof. There might be a contact injury or a weird injury, but yeah, the you rate... You can't, you can't prevent the contact injuries of ACL injuries if there's enough force. Of course, force right. And there's genetic and there's, there's yeah, all sorts of yeah. variables, obviously, that you have to account for, right? Yeah. But when we're just looking at illness and injury burden and things that we can control, I mean, keeping sleep debt under 45 minutes is a path to that. That will get you probably 80% of the way there. And it's a figuring out. I mean, I was a coach at Princeton University for 13 seasons, and that is a place where people, there is not, the culture is horrible there in terms of, the, I mean, the president of the university wore a t-shirt that said sleep is for the weak. So this is, I was fighting a lot of uh, cultural issues no. there. So, but as a coach, you know, you work with the players and you just, and you give them the data, you let them know this is the difference maker. This is the, com the greatest competitive advantage you can possibly get is, is, is literally eight hours of sleep, you know, and nine if you can swing it. And they would commit to four days a week, they would be consistent with their sleep and they would get, they would meet the sleep that they need. Um, and and if, you can, if you can tackle it from that approach, then it's a lot easier to talk yourself into a better future. I, you know, my background is in, in sports psychology and my PhD is in psychology. I spent a lot of time in this space. And you, if you are under, if you have sleep debt, you do not have the mental resilience. And Mita gave you a laundry list of what happens physically and mentally and emotionally when you have sleep debt. You fix the sleep and 90% of your problems go away. I feel pretty confident saying that. Yeah, I, don't, I, yeah, I think yeah. so. <laughs> and know. I, you know, when I just, again, um, uh, circle around to what you said about, about the clubs. I mean, it, you know, if you think about what a normal schedule, say, for a MLS team is, yeah. right? And so think about not just the fact that the, all the people who actually take care of the players, including the coaches, get there before the players. Mm -hmm. They leave after the players are done, and mm -hmm. they don't get paid as much. <laughs> And then they're living that life, right? So it's, it's not, it's, you know, it, it is a matter of slowly changing the culture. And I think that's the reason why we have a panel here talking about right. it, right? Yeah. Because we yeah. are trying to bring this, I mean, perhaps newer concepts that haven't been discussed before. And it really does start with education and awareness, yeah. as you were yeah. talking about. Right? I think that, I mean, I'm not working in a football world, unfortunately. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that, um, I mean, they have the same problem as the Formula One yes. drivers. So right. I don't know how a football player 
solve it. I mean, if they are taking medication to sleep, if they can fall asleep, because I guess that straight after a match, and at least for me, it would be really difficult to yeah. fall asleep. So I, mean, I need to understand yeah. how to switch off my brain. And this is not easy, mm -hmm. especially if you're not aware of how your brain is working. Yeah. Well, so of course, that, that's something that uh, we have to adapt every time we finish our match. We have to adapt what time we train the next day, if we train, if we're flying back or, or whatever we have to do the next day, just because we know we don't only get home at 12 o'clock at night or maybe 2 or 11, mm -hmm. but then we take into account how much time it takes for the player to slow down. And sometimes, especially when you, when you play at home, mm -hmm. still, it sometimes it's even worse because when you play mm -hmm. away, okay, you're flying or whatever, mm -hmm. and that gets, that gets you more tired. But then when you play at home, then you have to add more or less four hours as the average we have to add. For them, if we have to train the next day, try to make sure it's at least four hours later than usual. And going back to the, the sleeping habits and things like that, we know for sure that they, when they don't sleep as a whole, as a group, always I, I give you examples because I'm there every day. They're in a, such a bad mood. <laughs> like the locker room, my gosh. So I'm like, okay, guys, have to go to sleep, and tomorrow we have to go a little bit later because remember, they don't only are players, but they're adults, they have families, they have children, so mm -hmm. you have to adapt to that. And my approach, based on this data, and my approach is trying to translate all this amazing data that, again, I'm in love with it, to an easier language for them mm -hmm. to say, okay, I like it. If it's too complicated, I'm like, no, okay, this is too much. For me, it's going to be another thing that I have to do mm -hmm. that I'm already doing a lot. This sounds really hard. So trying to adapt to that as an as easier way. And uh, something that's really interesting regarding the stress rega related to injuries, we, are, we have data that um, players that find out that they're going to be parents for the first time mm -hmm. have almost 80% chance mm -hmm. of injury before the baby is born. It's amazing. Wow. So we have to make sure, actually have to make sure day by day. Not all the players are uh, obligated to work with me. Uh, the majority of them work with me. But the, the ones that don't, I have to make sure if that happens, then to try to approach them because something happens internally. I'm not a man, so I can't tell you what happens. But I know for the fact when they talk, there are a lot of questions once you happen to, you know, my wife is not going to pay attention to me. and sounds silly, but they get injured like 80% of, of the chances. But then in the second baby, it just goes down to 20 to 30%. So in the everyday mm -hmm. thing, again, I give you everyday examples. I have to make sure I follow them. So I have to tell the coach, this is happening, this is not happening. So if they have to press a lot, it's a day of a lot of workload, then you have to go back to make sure the player is being taken care of. Mm -hmm. You say one, one important thing now, and I think it's obvious, you are not a man. Um, I want to ask you, uh, and we start with the woman, maybe. Yes. Uh, do you think that there are gender differences in this recovery process, in this Sex. mental training? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sex differences, yeah. Cool. Yeah, we, we do, we're doing quite a lot of research in the female physiology area. How many folks are responsible for the care of um, female athletes, um, or the performance, if you can just raise your hand? Just curious. Is there even, anyone? Even, even panelists, you can raise um, your hand, too. <laughs> who has um, a sister, a wife, a girlfriend, a daughter? Raise your hand. Cutting. All right, we got folks. <laughs> um, yeah, so the menstrual cycle um, definitely is going to impact um, women differently. Um, just a quick one, too. There's roughly 28 days of, of the menstrual cycle. Uh, I'm going to get how this relates to recovery because it's just very, very clear sex differences in, in the data. Um, in the luteal phase, that is um, when you're preparing for menses, preparing for the menstrual cycle, and that's roughly a couple weeks. And then um, you, your um, follicular phase is menses and ovulation. And this is for women who are naturally cycling. Um, but if you know of um, you know, women who are, are playing professional sports or um, clubs that you're potentially affiliated with or working with, they need to start to learn that women are not small men, um, and we need to train differently than, than, um, than men as a result. Um, the follicular phase is a, is a low hormone phase. As a result, that's menses and, and ovulation. As a result, we can train way, way harder. We're more primed to adapt to external load uh, during that time frame. So that's when we want to do, you know, uh, all of our kind of functional overreaching as much as we can. So we really want to try to push our, our bodies. Um, and then the luteal phase, that's where more technical, more technique-based 
training would be more appropriate. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't go harder to luteal phase. I can't play in a match and do very well. But just understand that needs during that time are increased. It's a very effortful kind of phase of the cycle. My body is doing a ton of work during that time. As a result, I need to probably intake more sodium. I need to extend my sleep. And WHOOP has actually done some work with Dr. Stacy Sims. She was the principal investigator on um, some research that we published looking at um, 10,000 women. So this is a huge data set. And we saw these physiological perturbations across this four month, uh, four, uh, four week cycle. And um, as a result, we're able to coach women around their sleep, around their training, um, using these, these data uh, to be able to guide, guide that effort. So it was kind of a really novel finding, the first data set of its kind, which was really cool. Um, and to be able to kind of coach women um, in an in a area that literally has never been done before is, is, is pretty sweet. But so if you know someone, if you know a woman, um, yes. she can benefit. Well, and I, I mean, if you think about it, you know, we, we've come from an age or a, a time where even talking about the menstrual cycle is not something that they, that is done on a regular basis. Yeah. And again, it, you know, it, again, it has a lot of complications because if you're in a, if you're in a team sport, so let's talk about women's soccer, right? If you're mm -hmm. in a team sport, there is a certain schedule for the games. Mm -hmm. And so there's a training and everything that's, that's made to it, and yet, yet females are individuals, so they have mm -hmm. individual uh, you know, cycles and their individual psycho, uh, you know, physiology. Mm -hmm. And so you want to you wanna be, to, to be able to fit and give them advice that will fit into mm -hmm. them still being able to play at their maximum best when the team game actually happens, Absolutely. right? So it, yeah. it comes to the same thing that you you know, you can you you want to look at the science, and then you want to take the science, take it, and give recommendations that are based broadly, but as well as individually. And um, you know, we've always, I mean, that's something that's that's evolving. But this extra layer of that being female actually makes you even more different mm -hmm. is something that is it's good to keep on our radar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, in my field. There are not a lot of females, so, right. but we have been asked uh, from different big institutions to do a research project into that, and this is what we have been doing in the last month, and we are keeping uh, studying this, because of course there are differences uh, in terms of physical performance, I guess, that I've never <coughs> tried to, um, uh, to drive a Formula One car. Uh, but I think it's really demanding. This is what they always uh, tell us. So I guess that this is one of the reasons why maybe a female is not driving a Formula One car. Uh, but I think there, are, there should be any other difference in terms of uh, mental performance. And I, I, I believe they are way better compared to, <laughs> to us. But uh, we are really looking forward to complete the study to understand exactly the difference in terms of brain performance because from a scientific point of view, we all know that there are uh, different skills where women are better than men, so visual special, uh, special skills or something else. Uh, but we are really looking forward to, to have a better understanding of, of this. From us? Yeah, so we know there are definitely gender differences and individual differences in recovery and adapt, physiological adaptation to stress and to stimulus. And so this is like at the fundamental biological level. And I guess um, we're, we're all working on it. And in the endurance sports context, in the triathlon context, um, with, the, with the professional triathlete organization, um, as the head of the science committee, we've, we've just launched, we're gonna do a five-year longitudinal study comparing the top 50 men and women triathletes in the world and track as much data as we can, get as many, um, yeah, all the external, internal data, everything from them, and try to kind of untangle some of these differences between what is working for the women and, and men, and then be able to apply that, hopefully, and maybe, but I no guarantees, into the context of team sports and other sports. So we'll, we'll, we can talk about that in five years when, when we have some <laughs> <Yeah>. results. <laughs> Be here. <laughs> well, regarding my expertise, of course, I work with both men and women, and in, in the everyday, again, I, I, my approach and expertise is working with them before practice and before training and trying to 
Maybe they have the best training, understanding that whatever you do in practice from Monday to Friday is how you're going to play Saturday or Sunday. Mm -hmm. So in that approach, of course, uh, we have the woman is tense too. Uh, we tend to talk easier or faster or get into the point faster. Um, however, since this is like mental gym and we try to make reps, mental reps, and go to the, uh, to the field trying to see if they understand the coaches and things like that, in that sense, uh, the men are also very capable because they come. They take more time to trust you, I want to tell you, at the beginning. And, but then once they do, they're faithful. They get there, they know this because they see the results. So once they are there, they can actually go apply and then bring back and then try to... Actually, they, their communication improves. So within the team, it improves again, which means with the coach too. So in the mental training with the guys, that's, that's the... That's the improvement that we have seen. Okay, we, we are arrived at the end of this conference, only five minutes remaining. I, I, want to, I want to finish this conference doing a question. I will start with Agustina, I will finish with Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, have one minute only for putting the reflection on the table, okay? Good. So, after all the things that we have been speaking and been said, um, what do you think if can peak performance and well-being going who exist in the life of professional players and athletes? Yes, yes, they can, you can. I think because of the, uh, I'm, I'm going, I'm self-referenced, but if you train your mind, if you train towards whatever you want, it can be reached. Of course, we are under pressure as a player, as an athlete, uh, everything, if it's high performance, then we, sometimes it seems hard, like oh, if you have no life, you have nothing, you have to make a lot of sacrifices for your career. However, if you organize yourself, example is sleeping, and gonna ask, you organize the race and you train your mind. Whatever you want to do, I know it sounds uh, uh, cursy, but whatever you want and whatever your mind uh, wants to do, it can happen. You just need discipline, you need to be resilient, you need to, to train and, and, and understand how the mind works, and then you're gonna get results, and most importantly, you will retire when you want, and the sport won't retire you. And, the retirement, which can be another whole topic, um, is something really hard for us. So preparing ourselves during the career, it will be really important to face your new life after that. Thomas, you are still there. So yeah, I'll, I'll take a slightly different perspective on answering this and say that they can coexist and lead to optimal well-being and optimal performance. And it's only, only going to increase in the future as everything is going to become totally personalized in elite sports, and we're seeing the trend towards that. And I'm not a futurist, I'm a pragmatist about this. I 100% guarantee to all of you that in 10 years, elite level sports, everything will be measured in your body, will understand at the cellular level and the systems level what is happening inside the body in real time. And then that data can be used to find that optimal level where we find this balance. And so it, it's coming, um, be prepared for it. Um, most professional sports teams and leagues aren't 100% yet prepared for it, but we'll, we'll adapt and hopefully that will help the well-being and the safety and the performance of all athletes so they can reach their genetic potential. Yeah, I, I agree with, uh, with both of you. I mean, I think not only they can coexist, but they should, and they should. coexist. Yeah, that's, and, and I think, I think that that's all of our goals, that's, yeah, what's, yeah. that's what we strive for. Yeah, correct. So you, you cannot have peak performance, you are not feeling well in terms of uh, uh, yeah, awareness of uh, how you are. So uh, we, we, we need to do something to, to, to make sure that the wellness, and we, we, we need to reduce the, the, the fear to talk about mental performance and mental health. So I think that especially in football, there is still a, a stigma about mm -hmm. uh, mental performance. And, and I'm sure that if I approach a, a top uh, football player to say, you probably need some mental training, he would say, no, I don't need that because uh, I, I'm fit and well. I'm not weak, <laughs> I'm strong. <laughs> Correct, so this is why, especially with our athletes, we have been working a lot on the communication of uh, the mental training. This is why our sports psychology is, is always wearing the same uniform as we do. So mm -hmm. they train on the mental side without even knowing that Perfect. they are training <laughs> inside right. the mental gym. So. 
Well, I would say I would say that um, I I do agree with all of you. I think I think uh, uh, I think it's a laudable goal. I think we are far from it. I don't think we're there as yet because I think that most of the research shows that athletes are physically definitely better, you know, m way better than perhaps the the average human being. But they are also more likely to have mental health and sleep health issues, given the fact that they are they are high they work in this these high stress high performance areas. And I, so, so I think that that you know I think there's work to be done, mm -hmm. and and I think that's what what we are trying to do. You know, bring education, try to bring in all the resources and and to destigmatize mental health issues, uh, destigmatize your other issues so that you can at least address them openly uh, and and get them to a place where they are they are you know happy and um, performing well. Yeah, I mean I have access to a lot of high performance environments so I see this in action and I yeah. will say that the head coach is probably the biggest influence on our team. Yep. in terms of facilitating mental and physical health resilience. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that the coach necessarily appreciates how much influence that they actually have, but to me, that's how you get at it, and, and that's how you get at it really fast. And I've seen it, you know, like a, you know, the head coach of you know, Penn State football, for example, he's like, sleep is gonna be the most important thing that we do this year. <laughs> you know, he said it, and they had a wildly successful season, um, but most importantly, the subjective measures of well-being increased, they got better. Right? Um, same Penn State swimming. We, we did, um, Penn State, we published a case study so I can talk about it, but I can replicate the same example across you know, MLB and NHL and, and the, NFL and, and the um, seminal EPL. study from with the Stanford women's basketball team was yes, the first the one. They, Sherry they won a national championship. Exactly, right. yeah. So, but I think the head coach, to really make a difference, head coaches need to be on board. So, Thank you. Augustina, you need to work with the head coach. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, so we finished. Thank you very much. I want to thank a uh, big thank you for non-football experts, <laughs> but thank you very much for trying to bring these ideas to us. You said before, I think sometimes in football when we speak about mental abilities, mental training, uh, people is not so receptive. And I think that we need to we continue working in that direction of trying to introduce this, this big thing that we can do with the pro players. Thank you all of you for being there and spending this time with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.